What do you mean try and open it? I've got it started, okay. <laughs> right, good afternoon everybody. We thought it's been such a while since we've done a Facebook Live, we better get our butts in gear and do one. So, um, hello, say hello to my new reading glasses. Uh, I've reached that age where now I have to have very focal contact lenses and can't see to read anything anymore, which is a bit distraught really. It's uh, you reach that point when you get over 40 apparently, and I'm a little bit over that, so <laughs> it's just really tragic. Don't laugh. They're, they're uh, no, my... no, it's just the way you said it more than anything. <laughs> they're, they're my posh reading glasses. Actually, I think they're children's glasses, but there we go. They're really comfortable and they work, more to the point, so that's what's really cool, isn't it? So we thought what we'd do today is we would jump on and do a quick Q&A. So these are the types of questions that we have been asked over the last um, couple of weeks. We've had a huge flurry with the end of the tax year for self-employment and also with uh, February VAT returns or December VAT returns that were due in February. So we've had a huge amount of um, activity in those two areas. So some of our questions are kind of focused around those. So we thought we'd do this Q&A just to get ourselves back into the, the, the chairs of um, doing these Facebook Lives and getting in front of you all. So if you have any questions, please pop them up and ask them. Hopefully we can read them as we go along. Um, if not, we'll carry on with the questions that we have on our little blue cards. So I'll start then. Um, Diane asks, I want to pay myself a wage through my business. So how do I do that? So, well, first of all, if you're self-employed, you don't need to worry about that. You can just carry on taking whatever wages you are drawing through your self-employed business. But if you are a limited company, you would need to register as an employer. So you would register as an employer with HMRC, wait a month for that to come through, and, uh, sorry, phone, <laughs> I'm just going to hide it under the dog's bed so that they can't hear that. That's so, happened. You'd register, it's one of those things, isn't it? You do a Facebook Live, do you plan for somebody ringing in the phone being uh, off the hook? So you register as an employer and you get um, the letter back from HMRC that confirms your payroll details and your employer's reference. You need to run a basic payroll, weekly or monthly. Monthly would be a lot easier and you don't have to worry about it too much. Um, and then you can remember to post your RTIs every month, remember to pay yourself every month and remember to process your payroll details and post that information into your account so that you can include the cost in your profit and loss. Now, if you're a, a small person, a small employer running a very small business, you can pay yourself £5,876 per year, that's £113 a week, without running a payroll at all, without having to register as an employer. But if you want to go over that, you do have to register as an employer. You can pay yourself £8,164 a year, which is a basic director's payroll. You wouldn't pay any national insurance on that amount but you would still get the national insurance credit, so you still get your entitlement to state pension and benefits. The difference between the 8164 and the 5876, if you're a limited company, is an additional £2,288 that you can put through your business accounts as a tax deductible expense. So it's well worth doing that and it reduces your corporation tax. So that's the first question, how to pay myself a wage through my business, how do I go about doing it? If you get stuck, obviously go and ask an accountant. Right, how are you going to answer again. the next I'm one? I'm going to say, go through this Hi Amanda, I did see your message, but didn't want to interrupt me. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so while Lisa sorts out the phones, I'm going to go on to the next question. So um, the next question we heard this week was, um, what am I taxed on? Now that sounds like a really obvious one to some, but not to many actually, because that's quite a common question. Um, so basically, you're taxed on not just the funds you draw, but there's basically a variation of what you could be taxed on. So, especially if you're a director as well, because if you're a director, you're open to dividends. So, you are taxed on the wages that are processed through payroll, so pay as you earn. And this is, the, of course, the most common, but also if you're a director, you're taxed on the dividends you physically draw out as well. Now... Hello. Again, it's my dog. 
<laughs> You're taxed on the dividends you drew out as well. But dividend tax works slightly differently to my uh, to PAYE. And at the moment, well, when we move on to making tax digital eventually, this will become a bit more frequent. But for now, it's a yearly payment to pay your dividends. And dividend tax, the first £5,000 is tax free. And then after that, you'll be required to pay tax on your dividends. Um, but there's also other items you may be taxed on when you draw cash out of the business. Some of them are a little bit more subtle because you might not physically notice the cash going into your bank account. So, for example, if you're putting through medical insurance through your company, uh, these will still be taxable, but they'll be declared as benefit in kind on a P11D. And along with cars and all of the other various expenses which go through your business. You may not receive the cash directly, but you still receive the benefits. Yes, so that might be a beneficial loan, mm. um, medical insurance, a gym membership perhaps if you're that way inclined and you want to pay your staff uh, your gym membership. Um, all of those will go through your accounts, are a tax deductible expense, but don't forget that you do have to do a PLMD at the end of the year, unless you start payrolling your expenses. Now, no, so in that's fact, actually, that reminds me, on the topic of expenses, if you pay for any company expenses yourself and you claim about the expenses, when you take the cash for the expenses, you don't pay tax on those. Yeah, because absolutely. Because you've already physically paid the cash out of your, by basically paying out of your earnings. So, put one just to mention on that one. Yes, so treat that as an expense, doesn't need to go on a P11D. Talking about payrolling expense, um, I wasn't going to bring this up today, but we might as well since <laughs> we're approaching uh, another April year end. If you want to put payroll expenses through your payroll, so instead of looking at, instead of de um, declaring your car or your medical insurance at the end of the year, um, you'll receive the benefit from April through to June, for April through to March. Then you declare it on your P11D, sort of June or July time. Then it hits your uh, tax code in about September, October. What you could do is put that benefit through your payroll from the April, but you do have to register to payroll your benefits from the 1st of April or from the 5th of 6th of April onwards. So if you're gonna do your um, benefits through payroll, you need to think about that now in time for the next tax year. So that's something that we're gonna be talking to all our clients about because it just does save all the faff and pomp with a P11D. Um, which is uh, you know a pain in the bum to get done at the end of the year, and it it shocks the employee. So I had a query from um, somebody this week who had, uh, she's a new starter to one of my clients. She joined um, at sort of end of November time, and she's just got noticed that there's a, a P11 D cost medical insurance on her tax code. So she wrote to me demanding to know why I put this on her tax code and then I had to explain to her that actually this relates to tax that you're paying on benefits you received in the last tax year. It's got nothing to do with this tax year. So I'm not sure whether she believed me or not. Um, we'll find out when she <laughs> responds this week. She didn't seem very happy. So um, yes, that you can get away from all of that if you actually put it through your, your payroll and then they'll be taxed in the month they receive the benefit um, instead of 18 months later, which can be uh, a pain in the bum. Mm. So, uh, I have another question from Diane, um, which was, I have my first employee, what do I need to do? Well, you have less choice over how much you want to put through payroll, because obviously whatever you've offered your employee is what you then have to account for as an employer. But what you do need to do is register as an employer, if you're not registered already. Um, you need to run your payroll for your employee weekly or monthly depending on um, however you've agreed payment terms with your employee. Don't be late so make sure that you actually get everything in in time. You need to make sure the payment is run or the payroll is run and the RTI is posted on or before the day you actually pay your employee. So same day is fine but don't post your RTIs the day after you pay your employees because then you'll get fined for late filing. HMRC wants to know before you pay your staff. So don't forget if you are an employer and if you have staff, you can then tick the box for employer's allowance. 
So we often see clients forget their employer's allowance and then we have to go back and do a late claim for it, which can be done, but it takes months sometimes to get the cash back from HMRC. Once they've taken it from you, they don't want to let it go again. Yeah, they're very slow on that side <laughs> yeah. of things. Quick on taking it, quick not on taking it back. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And any claim back for a prior period has to be done through HMRC's um, basic tool system, which is uh, a bit rubbish, to be fair, isn't it? A bit yeah, rubbish. It's, it's, not, it's not a deal. It's not it good. works, but it's not a deal. It works sometimes. <laughs> yeah, when sometimes. it wants to, <laughs> as with yes. most of HMRC's systems. <laughs> yeah, so get it right in the first place, and then don't worry about having to put it through HMRC's basic tools. Mm. So what you then need to do is make sure you understand what your gross pay is for your employee, your employee and the cost to you is going to be that gross cost plus your employer's national insurance less the £3,000 per year um, employer's allowance. Now that only relates to employer's national insurance. Your employee will still pay tax and national insurance on their wages. Um, so again, that's another query that came up this week. Um, one of our clients um, couldn't understand why there was a, a, pay, a payroll liability to HMRC for their new employee. She was earning about 20000 a year, so she's well above the thresholds for national insurance and tax. The ERS national insurance is credited, so they don't get charged that for the first £3,000 in this tax year and next tax year if it rolls over. But they still have to pay the employees national insurance and the employees PAYE over to HMRC. So I've explained that to her and hopefully she'll understand. Now the thing to, to take into account if you are going to take on an employee is that all of a sudden you as an employer have to uh, oblige by certain rules and regulations. You have to make sure they've got holiday pay, you have to make sure that you accrue holiday and you pay them their holiday. Um, or they they must be allowed to take holiday. Uh, you, you have to come to some kind of arrangement about what suits you and what suits them, because typically you want to go on holiday at the same time. Um, that can be fun when you're a small employer <laughs> with um, deadlines that you need to to achieve. Um, make sure they've got an employment contract. Make sure you've got a staff manual so people know your employees need to know what standards are allowed in your place of work, what time they need to start, what time they need to finish, what's contractual and what's not, what their company holiday pay policy is, what your company sick pay policy is, um, whether there is even any company sick pay. So although we are obliged to pay our employees 20 days plus 8 days bank holiday for holidays, we have no obligation to pay them a company sick pay. Statutory sick pay, yes of course, company sick pay, not obliged. Um, you read it in the messenger. What is the change to mortgage interest rates expenses from 2017 for property rental? Do they still get an allowable expense? Uh, yes, Donna, they do, but not at the 100% that we are used to seeing in the past. I think that it's been reduced over the next five years, so it either goes down by 20 or 25% per year. Uh, I can't remember offhand, but I will confirm afterwards. So you'll still be able to get some of it back next year, but not all of it. But if you are renting out a property, don't forget to include all of the expense costs of that property and the mileage costs of you travelling to or from that property to do rent reviews, um, any agency or advertising or any direct costs that relate to that particular property. Now, um, just going back to what else to do when you've got your first employee, if you do get stuck, this is one of those things that it's too important to get wrong. So if you do get stuck, see a HR specialist for the contracts and for the legal side of things, make sure you're covered and you're airtight, um, and also talk to an accountant about payroll. So you can get white labelled outsourced payroll for a couple of pounds a month in some instances. So it, it's well worth doing it. Don't struggle through it on your own if you're not able to. <laughs> Building on from new employees, uh, we actually got another query this week, um, which is basically when you get a new starter, what happens if the employee doesn't provide a P45? Now, um, as which is Lisa, really common, isn't it? It's really common, yeah. But um, as Lisa mentioned with employees starting, there's various documentation you'll need to collect from your employee, such as passport copies, their bank details, obviously. Funny if not, and of course a 
basically it's either a P45 or a form which was formerly called the P46, which Shining is the starter. Yeah, that's true. Oh. Definitely. Which is the starter declaration checklist, and basically this is a form generated from HMRC. If they can't provide a P45 from their most recent employment, then we should be collecting the starter checklist information instead. Yes, definitely. And what this means is it determines that they're on the correct tax code. So it's it's a very important form. It's basically a lot of employees like to give you their bank details, and then they're a bit slower on providing the other forms but it's really important for payroll because either that they they even end up on the wrong tax code which they obviously don't like so it basically determines whether or not they should be on a basic rate tax code a non-cumulative tax code or a cumulative tax code so it's really useful from that perspective it works in a similar way as a p45 basically yeah. When a P45 is not present, it gives the information that HMRC needs in order to then update their records going forward. Yeah. Now, a common issue we see with new new starters on payroll is a new starter comes in, they might have a secondary job um, or, or they might have finished that secondary job and come into working with one of our clients and then they tell us they're on the wrong tax code. Um, well. We, as the employer or as the employer's payroll company, have to put you on the tax code that either is on your P45 or in accordance with the data on the new starter form or um, what HMRC tell us. So if you think you're on the wrong tax code, the person to talk to is advise your employer by all means, do that definitely, but the person to talk to is HMRC. So give them a ring, talk to somebody on the self-assessment helpline, they do look at these issues really, really quickly, update their systems, that pops through to the employer, and then the employer gets notified, usually in time for the next pay run. So you might be able to get an advance, perhaps if you're on a, a substantially wrong tax code, you might find that actually you might want to wait until the next pay run, but normally it's in there for the next pay run, and then you get a nice little um, tax rebate. So we had that very issue um, happen to one of our clients' employees this week. Um, she'd been working for the entire tax year um, for our employer, uh, for our client. She started the tax year with two jobs. So she was on basic rate, non-cumulative, so she was paying tax on all of her earnings for the entire year, part-timer. She stopped doing her other part-time job and carried on with this part-time job. Um, mentioned that, you know, it's Christmas and things are a little bit tight. Um, unbeknownst to her, HMRC has completed all of their end-of-year returns and then they sent us a tax code <coughs> update. So actually what she received in her um, early February payroll was a £1,000 tax rebate. So she was super chuffed. <laughs> So, and after a little bit of investigation, we were able to tell her that, yeah, actually, that is right, you can keep it, and uh, it's all yours. So she was super pleased. Yeah, just showing them the pay in the first place, though. Well, yes, so well, the thing yeah. is, she'd, she'd managed without it for the whole of the, um, the time that she'd been employed with our, our client, thinking that she was on the right tax code and that this is just what she was earning, and it uh, turns out she was inadvertently saving, <laughs> so she was super chuffed, and she's paid off her credit card bill, so she's a very happy lady. Right, so I had a question from Pete yesterday who wanted to know when do I need to think about registering for VAT? So, um, you know, the excitement just swells, doesn't it? It's uh, amazing. So, HMRC rules are that you need to start registering for VAT when your VATable sales exceed or are likely to exceed 85,000 in the next 30 days. Now, that's quite not. <laughs> Uh, Amanda asks, can I have one of those rebates? I think we'd all like one. <laughs> um, but we have to have overpaid tax in the first place. So uh, unfortunately, that doesn't apply to me, but we can look and see whether it applies to you. Um, so Pete wants to know, when do I need to think about registering for VAT? Um, when your VATable sales goes over £85,000 per year. Now, he sells 80% uh, of his business is in the UK, 77 or maybe 75 to 80% of his business is in the UK, but 20 to 25% of his business is overseas um, in the States, so he has customers that are in uh, America. Um, America, um, Hong Kong, Asia, China, uh, Australia, New Zealand, all outside Europe, outside the UK, all considered to be rest of world. 
rest of world is excluded, it's out of scope of VAT, so it's not even considered for purposes of VAT. So because his VATable sales to the UK are well under the VAT threshold, he's fine, so he needs to keep an eye on his VATable th sales to the UK, but if he starts to exceed um, those in the UK, he needs to think about registering for VAT. If he sells in the US, he doesn't need to worry about VAT. So if he only sold in the US, he might want to voluntarily register for VAT so that he could recover the VAT only costs he's incurring, but he wouldn't have to pay any output tax or tax on his sales if all of his sales were rest of world and out of the scope of VAT. So that then gives rise to the question, when do I need to think about it from a UK point of view? So if you do need to think about it, um, we, we have two clients in, in two um, different types of business. So, so Pete's in a, a consultancy business and his typical UK businesses, his typical UK business customers are all going to be businesses, they're all going to be VAT registered. So when he starts to apply VAT to his sales, it's not really a big deal because all of his customers will be VAT registered, it's sales output VAT for him, it's purchase input VAT for them, so they'll just be able to recover it. We have another client who runs a small cafe and his customers are all consumers, so they're all private individuals. They can't recover the VAT. So now he has a really big question. Does he deliberately keep his business below the, threat he th the VAT threshold so that he stays around about the 80 to 85K mark without going over? Or does he put his prices up <coughs> by 20% to then allow him to charge VAT to his customers? and get that cash sent off to HMRC to pay his VAT liabilities at the end of each quarter. Now the challenge for our, our cafe client is that if his customers can't tolerate a 20% increase and instead of going to Bob's CAF they're going to go to Wendy's CAF, this could be a massive detriment to him and could really cause a problem for his business. Whereas our consultant client, doesn't matter to him, he can register whenever it suits him. So that's a, a real challenge. The question for a business to consumer client is who is going to absorb the cost of that VAT. So suddenly you think you've turned over £85,000 a year, if you can't turn that cost over and push that cost onto your clients, all of a sudden you actually turned over a £70,833 a year business and the difference of £14,200 is owed to HMRC. So that's a really nasty shock. Now I have seen um, quite a few blog posts, uh, articles debating over whether HMRC are going to increase or reduce the VAT threshold. Um, there has been uh, a couple of articles proposing that HMRC reduce the VAT threshold to 25,000. If they do that, that would be a nightmare. It could be hugely damaging for the smaller business. Thankfully I don't think they're going to do it, um, but they could do. You just never know, do you? Yeah, that's quite interesting, though, because we had a VAT specialist talking about this. Yes. And um, he mentioned that other countries, some countries have literally no no, no, no turnover yeah. as their VAT registration mm -hmm. threshold. Some of them have. Uh, there was one who had something obscenely high. I can't even remember what it was. It was like you're never going to reach that. Probably Estonia. Or <laughs> something like that. that. But um, it's the, the whole concept of it is um, it's basically a cliff edge. You get to mm -hmm. the 85, and then what happens is the second you drop over that threshold, um, you either take a massive dip in your sales or you have a massive price increase which causes problems for your clients. Yeah. And it's uh, one of those really big questions that they're trying to still resolve now. So yeah, it's a bit of a nasty one that one. But it is indeed. It's interesting from an accounting perspective, it's just nasty from a client perspective. Um, and actually this ironically links into my <laughs> next question. Yeah, we haven't planned this at all. Uh, um, <laughs> Is it worth registering for that voluntarily? Now, that's not normally a question you'd hear people asking all the time, but um, actually sometimes voluntarily registering for VAT can actually be beneficial. But um, the main things to think about is obviously who your client base are and whether or not your actual purchases will have that inclusive elements on them. Um, if you're trading between business to business, then becoming that registered won't impact your business customers too dramatically because they're probably used to paying VAT anyway. If your actual end customer is a consumer, then a 20% increase on price suddenly becomes quite a dramatic increase. So 
So it's worth considering that. And as well as this, it's also worth considering how many of your suppliers are Vatimal services. Uh, if they're all outside of the UK and outside of Europe and you don't have any VAT to pay anyway, then you're not actually going to benefit from any recovery. So it's just worth considering these to make sure that, of course, you're not actually losing out on money unnecessarily. But from another perspective, being VAT registered suddenly makes you look more professional and more distinguished as a business, say if you're a consultant. Um, basically being VAT registered disguises your size a little bit. Mm. So you could be turning over less than £85,000, but if you're dealing with a company that's, I don't know, say a multinational company, quite large, quite significant, and you are VAT registered, they may not necessarily know that. So mm -hmm. they may think you're bigger and more reputable as, a, as basically a knock-on effect. So it's just worth considering some of these things. Mm, and we do see that quite a lot. It's um, small customer clients just starting off that are limited companies will often go VAT registered and limited right from the get-go um, because it makes them look and feel that little bit more professional, that little bit more polished, a little bit larger. And it the, the limited liability aspect makes them feel like they've got a little more security, yeah. even though they've then got to run payroll and you know publish statutory accounts. But so just be it's careful, don't miss thought. any VAT payments. Because yeah, no, if you miss any VAT payments, all of a sudden the benefit wears off. Yes, <laughs> so, yeah. massively yeah. and immediately. Yeah, and then that's when they get problems. It's not, not good. Yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, another question we had. Um, this is probably in the last month or so, um, but it's one we see regularly in, in various um, small business groups. I sell digital courses, so must I register for VAT? Well, yes, um, if you're not above the threshold, but you are going to um, sell digitally, then you do have to register register for VAT under the VATMOS system. So this is the one-stop shop. If you're selling digital sales to um, business to business and your business is rest of world, then again, it's outside the scope of VAT, you don't have to worry about it. If it's business to business in Europe, so long as your customer gives you their VAT registration number, you can zero rate the sale and you don't have to worry about it. If your customer is a consumer and a private individual, this is where it gets really complicated. Your VAT is liable at the rate applicable in the, co the country that your customer is based in. So all of a sudden, you have to start charging VAT at 20 or 30 different VAT rates. Now there are systems and processes out there, there's a, a tool called Quaderno um, which links to um, uh, most online shops, it, it links to Stripe, so Stripe will collect the £500 that you want to charge for your course, Quaderno will work out where your uh, client is, how much VAT is liable at the rate in that uh, uh, customer's country and will tell you what you need to pay over and, and when. So there are lots of um, measures in place to make sure that you can cater for these sorts of things. Even though you're selling the digital courses, you don't have to register for that in the UK if your core other business is not um, at that threshold yet. This is just concerning digital sales. So it's not quite as horrendous as it might sound. Um, there's a, a lot of scaremongering going around about digital sales and what you do and don't have to do, but it is manageable. Use online accounting systems like Xero, use Stripe to collect the payments, use Quaderno to identify what your VATMOS liabilities are, and then you just pay whatever you need to pay to the tax authorities when the, the payment is due. Um, I'll write a note on it in the bottom, Kim, so I'll send you a link to the Quaderno site. Uh, it's really good, and if you register for their newsletter, um, as I know you like newsletters, they do do some really cool um, blog posts about VAT and uh, VAT in different countries, so it's a really good tool to have a look at. Now, over to you, Harry. I'll tell you this one. Uh, another question, this is quite a nice one. Um, uh, we like them when they turn out like this. Yes. But um, basically, one of our clients uh, recently... They were rummaging through some documents and they found a a VAT invoice for a lease agreement. And it was quite a it was quite an old lease agreement. And traditionally they didn't realise, but um, the bookkeeper had put through the spends without VAT, which is the correct treatment because they it's didn't have a copy yeah, of the invoice. Yeah, yeah. And what we then realised is that 
we have an invoice with VAT elements which hadn't been reclaimed and it stemmed back several years. So the question they asked is can they claim the VAT back if they hadn't done so previously? And the answer is beautifully, yes they can. And even if it means it's backdated, essentially it just comes forward as a late claim. So what you may find with these, if it is in this example like a lease agreement, you may find the actual lease agreement goes back several years, in which case your accounts have already been filed. So you just need to make an adjustment in the current year to account for the difference in the VAT. So basically you recover back some of the cost from your accounts, so you increase your profits, and then you get to recover the VAT back as well. So it's kind of a bit of a win-win really, and uh, you can do this on basically any invoices which you find which were either accounted for incorrectly previously, or the VAT was missed, or if they were just missed invoices. You just bring them through as a late claim, and you adjust for them in your most recent VAT return. So we like those ones. Yes, yeah. <laughs> we, we find that surprisingly often. Um, but what typically happens is you'll find a client or, or somebody who set themselves up in business, they've got lots of paper, but what they don't have is a proper filing system. So we, we just constantly are reminded of the importance of having a good filing system, keeping all of the paperwork that might be related to your business, keeping it in a folder, keeping it all together. So typically what we find is piles of paperwork on desks or drawers of receipts, bags of receipts, shoe boxes, you know, you name it, we've seen it all. Um, and all of these piles of all of these piles of paper and these wads of information have usually got recoverable VAT in or mm. business expenses that the, the client had forgotten about but they're, they're legitimate claims that can go through their accounts. So the importance of keeping good paperwork and a good paper trail is so huge. Mm, you know, yeah. lever arch files, A4 files, doesn't matter. Just make sure that you, you stack them in, doesn't matter whether it's alphabetically or in month order. Month order will be easier to reconcile with your bank statements, so, but it doesn't have to be that way. We know lots of people who like to see um, everybody. <laughs> Amanda, have you been peeking at my desk again? <laughs> no, I've been peeking at mine. <laughs> so I'm dreadful for stuff that comes through the door and it looks interesting and I put it on a big pile at the side. So, But it's not my important stuff pile, it's my um, stuff I will look at at some point because it's, it's interesting but it's not important. My urgent stuff gets all scanned in, it gets de dealt with on the day or the day after if it's a weekend and I have a process. So it's really, really important to have a process for your papers, for your receipts, whether you use a receipt bank to take pictures of the receipts, whether you have a folder and everything's all done on paper. It doesn't matter. Whatever suits you, just make sure you've got a system. Yeah. So and much money gets lost in what's yeah, it does. left and everywhere. Especially for assets as well. If you've purchased assets, these are like one of the key areas mm. to remember to keep the invoices for. Uh, in particular, if you're not yet VAT registered and you have these asset purchases which have VAT on them, you may come to use them later when you do become VAT registered, providing you still have the assets within your business because then you can claim the VAT on them. Yeah. So it's important to keep these, you don't want to lose out on them. No, and then when you do claim the VAT back on something that you've bought previously, you ha keep the invoice, keep the data, and you have to say what you've got, why you've got it, and why you've included it in a, in a claim. So you can't put that on the VAT return, of course. Typically what we do is we just keep a spreadsheet or a, you know, notes in the accounting system to say what we've done and why, to justify why something has been included in uh, a, a new registry VAT return when it had been accounted for previously. So the chances of HMRC auditing you are very, very slim, but make sure if they do audit you, you've got the data to prove why you did what you did in your VAT return. Yeah. Right, Jackie asked, where can I find free banking? Well, that's a really common question for startups. Um, actually, it's quite a common question for people in business for a while. It, it's getting harder and harder to find free banking. I don't think there is such a thing as truly free banking anymore. Now, we do have clients who have um, bank accounts where they don't pay any charges. So Santander uh, and Direct Line both used to have 
um, bank accounts with no charges, but they're, they're, they're digital accounts basically. So you, can, you can't pay cash into the bank, or, or not traditionally, you can't pay checks in. You have to go to a post office and get the cash transferred over. It's not as easy. But for companies that have the majority of their bank transactions are online, that type of account, that digital account, will work really, really well. Um, you just can't go into a bank and do anything uh, with it. And that becomes a pain for some of the smaller businesses that might have cash payments. Now, I haven't seen, I did have a look on their websites earlier this week, I can't see that those types of accounts are still available. But you can get free banking if you are a member of the FSB and you bank with the co-op. So you've got lifetime free banking with the co-op if you are a member of the FSB. So some people like the co-op bank account, some people don't, it's a matter of preference. Um, if you use zero, they feed quite well into zero, so it's you know not an issue for your accountant, um, so long as you can get access to the information. Um, any bank will have um, a switch period where if they're trying to convert you from another bank, you'll have six to 12 months interest-free banking, some longer, and other banks have um, banking free periods for uh, or charge free periods for new starters and you know people who are just getting going charities kicks that kind of thing will also have a, an element of free banking sorry that's the dog just getting himself comfortable in his bean bag um, but nobody really has truly free banking going in the longer term now what I would say is sometimes more importantly than free banking is the ability to have a bank that you trust that is convenient, um, where the charges are competitive and not too high, um, where they've got the facility for an overdraft if you want one. Um, some people prefer to go in and see a bank manager and they are available in some banks, um, not very many, but um, you, know, you can go in and see people in some banks. And in others, everything's all done online. So I personally use HSBC. <coughs> um, I find their, their charges are reasonable, their service is good, their online systems work effectively. And when I had an issue uh, a couple of years ago with somebody um, putting some fraudulent transactions through my account, I got the cash back in um, 24 hours. So it was all very, very good. So. There, there are some good banks out there, even though they're not truly free anymore. Mm. On the topic of free and more expensive options, um, if you use a payment gateway, <coughs> sorry, if you use a payment gateway, um, there's a question that's been going around basically, which payment gateway is best to use? And in particular, uh, the ones that <coughs> people are getting quite on board with at the moment, obviously PayPal and Stripe. Now. PayPal in itself is quite expensive mm. and Stripe is noticeably cheaper. From an efficiency perspective, they both are very efficient. It basically just depends on what your endpoint customer is looking for when it comes to a payment gateway. Um, and we find now more businesses are turning towards Stripe because of the lower fees. <coughs> Whew, there we go. Uh, yeah, more people are sending to be uh, turning towards Stripe now because, yeah, like I say, fees are better and um, sorry, the, the convenience of the online uh, account is quite good. When you have a Stripe account, you can log in and see you know, who has paid you and, and what's happened when they've paid you. You can set up repair, recurring payments. Um, it, it's very, very efficient, um, but don't dismiss the use of PayPal. Some people yeah. don't have credit cards or they don't have um, they, they prefer to use PayPal because it's easier as a buyer to use PayPal sometimes than it is um, to use Stripe. So we have both. Um, I try and encourage people to use Stripe or to pay by Bax because obviously Bax has even less charges or no charges. Um, but if you're going to have the payment gateways there, you might as well have both and give your client every opportunity to pay you. So the worst thing is to have somebody who has a PayPal account, you won't offer it because your fees are really high, will you waste more than that in chasing them and yeah, calling them exactly. and trying to get payment by card or by backs or, or whatever. Just make it as easy as possible for clients to pay you. The clients that tend to be big enough to incur heavier charges 
are probably the ones that are more likely to use stripe or backs. So it's only the very small ones that tend, in our experience, that tend to prefer uh, a PayPal provision. And your charges may be higher, but at least you get paid. Exactly. So my final question came from a webinar I gave a couple of weeks ago um, where one of the ladies who was in the group said that she pays for insurance. Is that a business deductible expense? Well, that depends. Um, it depends on who the beneficiary is. Now, if, if you are the beneficiary and the, the say the, um, expense, the, the insurance was a, an income insurance, so you're paying an insurance policy to protect your income should no, you not be able to work. Well, if you're going to put that through the business, that's the benefit in kind that you will pay tax on through payroll. Um, if you are self-employed, it's not an allowable business expense because the beneficiary is you personally. If it's a business insurance and say the business is the beneficiary, <coughs> perhaps it's a key man insurance and this is to provide the business with enough funds to employ somebody else to cover the key man while they were off, then they are allowable expenses so they're fine. So um, that's the end of our Q&A for today. We've um, given you a, a flavour of all the questions that we've had uh, or some of the questions that we've had in the last week or two. Um, we do have, we, we tend to get a lot of very similar questions and every now and again you get something that's really sort of out the park and uh, quite interesting and that um, uh, that becomes a, a blog post or a, a, a Facebook live in its own right. Um, so if you've got any more questions, do pop them up into the chat box now. Uh, we would also like to invite you to our webinar next week. So you have to excuse me, my throat's getting a little dry. It's infectious. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Harry's brought a cold into the office and probably caught it from the office in the yeah, first place. If you see my mouth doing this a little bit, it's literally because I can't read from my nose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I apologise for that. That's probably people noticed that. Like, what is he doing with that? Yeah, it's because so I can't read. Full of nasty green stuff. Yeah. But it's nearly gone. <laughs> yes. So next Wednesday, no, next Thursday, Friday, next Friday at 3 p.m., uh, we'll be doing a webinar on cash, cash credit control. So how to get more cash into your business and how to get it in faster. So this isn't about sales. This is just about trying to collect the cash that you uh, already have. So uh, not the heat wave there then. No, no heat wave here. Sadly, no. <laughs> we, we had a nice sunny day yesterday, Kim. But, uh, but I'm pretty sure it snowed two days ago. <laughs> yeah, it yeah. snowed, then it was really sunny. Yeah. So it was a bit bizarre. So next Friday at 3 p.m., we will be doing um, a webinar on credit control. So we'll send you the link for that and then you can come and join us perhaps. Um, so this will be a voiceover screenshots. Um, so a bit more slick than this one. So, <laughs> what snow says Kim who lives in oh, Portugal? Oh, that's cheeky. <laughs> <coughs> yes. We'll do a science experiment and show you. What sand? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't get that. We don't get that on our beaches. It's all gravel. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we're going to try and do more Facebook Lives. Every time we say that, something really big happens and we have to focus on delivering client stuff. But... Uh, um, if you've enjoyed this, please like and thanks for, uh, for joining us. Please share. Um, please invite your friends to join us here in Bloody Brilliant Business Bookkeeping. And we'll do lots more Facebook Lives answering your questions uh, next week. Well, not next week because you're out for three days. and uh, <laughs> We'll be here on Friday doing a cash webinar. And Henry's now decided to rearrange his bed. So that's nice. <laughs> right, nice to see you all. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.